Hello, my name is Vasilisa Zhuko. Welcome to my channel about brain research. Today we will talk about neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the process of uh, growth and uh, maturation of neuronal cells in the nervous system. And of course, this uh, process is very active during early stages of the brain development, but also it continues afterwards. And for a long time, researchers considered neuronal cells as the cells that cannot grow in the adult brain. But nowadays, we understand that it is not true, it is a myth. And today we have a guest on our channel, a neuroscientist from Australia, from the Brain Institute of Queensland, Dr. Danisha Jvari. She was one of the first people who could disprove the myth about neurons and neurogenesis in the adult brain. Hello, Denisha. Hello, Vasilisa. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. I actually ask people in my social media what uh, they think about uh, neurogenesis, like the appearance of new neurons in the adult brain. And still, a lot of people think that uh, neurons uh, cannot grow in the adult brain. And today we will explain that they actually can but it is not always good, but sometimes it is very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, when I prepared um, to this episode, I found that the first marks of neurogenesis were discovered already in the 60s, but then this uh, event, this phenomenon was rediscovered in the 90s. Could you please explain why it took almost 30 years to rediscover neurogenesis in the adult brain. Yes, so I think you're absolutely right. I think some of the first evidence were published by um, Joseph Altman and his colleagues, uh, Gopal Das actually, and they were working at uh, MIT in, in those days. And what they did, it's almost like they challenged the dogma that was prevailing at that time. And the dogma, as you correctly said, was that no new neurons can be generated in the adult brain. And this perhaps was based on some of the initial work of, you know, the um, our father of our modern neuroscience, Ramoni Kahal. And in his doctrine, he had basically emphasized that these nerve parts are something immutable. Everything may die, but nothing can be regenerated. And I think that view really prevailed and dominated in the neuroscience community till the time Joseph Altman challenged it. And what he did was uh, very interesting. So at that time, uh, a radio labeled um, thymidine, one of the analogs of, you know, um, the base pairs. Um, so actually, the, the, the base pair itself, the radio labeled thymidine, um, the technique was developed where that can be administered in animals and through radio autoradiography, uh, one can see which cells are taking up. And as you know, it's only during cell division that you know thymidine will be incorporated in the DNA. So he provided some of the first evidence and he, he published a series of papers, I think in 1960, starting from 62 to 63, 65, where especially in rodent um, brain, he showed that in the hippocampus, a region which is involved in learning and memory, um, he could see really nice um, cells which were positive or radiographically positive, suggesting that they were newly generated. But one of the issues of those times were that he was not able to definitively prove that these were neurons. So the thinking in the field for some time was 
perhaps they could be glial cells or other support cells. So there was no definitive um, evidence um, in, in, in during that time. And in fact, some of those studies were replicated later on, about 15 years uh, later, so not in 1990s, but more in 1970s, by another researcher, Michael Kaplan. And he was a, another brilliant researcher who also showed uh, in a series of work which backed actually Joseph Altman's data. But again, his work was dismissed. And this is very interesting, keeping in mind really the history of science and history of especially neurogenesis, how when one tried to go against the prevailing dogma, yes, people exactly. were not, yeah, people were not taken seriously. And perhaps there was also sort of a dominant figure and a dominant voice in the field. He was considered one of the, at the forefront of primate development. And he opposed this idea or, or that he could not really replicate some of the studies that mm -hmm. Joseph Altman and Kaplan did. So I think that's where the field went almost silent and flat. It almost like uh, no other people really took up that. But again, in 1990s, as you said, there was a resurgence in this field. So it was almost like uh, the field was rediscovered. And that was perhaps because I think there were a lot of advances in the technology um, that were made. I mean, sometimes I feel science advances along with the technological advancement. Indeed. And in this, yeah, and in this case, I think it was probably three major development that really re-establish the concept of adult neurogenesis in the field. The first was where there were new techniques that allowed labeling of specific cell types. In this case, distinguishing between neurons and glial. So there were definitive markers like MAP2, NUN, antibodies mm -hmm. to those were developed. And along with that, a major other development was um, using the analog of uh, thymidine, you know, BRDU, the bromodeoxyridine. So that could be administered to animals and the incorporation into the dividing cells could be read out using simple immunohistochemistry. It didn't require all the autoradiography, which can be quite tedious. I want to just uh, explain a bit for the broad audience that uh, in the brain we have neuronal progenitor cells. These cells are quite similar to stem cells. It means that in a specific environment or under specific conditions, uh, these cells can turn into neuronal cells or into astrocytes, for example. And uh, each of these cells, during different stages of their development, they express specific proteins and researchers uh, apply some uh, techniques, for example, fluorescent labeling or immunohistochemistry, uh, trying to identify cells during their development. This is how uh, researchers can prove that this is a neuron, this is a newly generated neuron, or this is astrocyte, for example. So they, they are looking for these specific proteins. Absolutely. The expression of specific proteins, which defines a particular cell type, whether it is a neuron or whether it's a glia. So as I was saying, it's the uh, really advancement in this technology where one could use simpler methods to label dividing cells and actually read out what those cells mm -hmm. are that allowed researchers to actually show again, mainly in the hippocampus initially. Uh, in the dentate virus, a region of the hippocampus, that these neurons are generated in the adult life. Along with that, there were also other assays that were developed in 1990s. Now that you mentioned stem cells, in fact, some of the earlier assays, um, which are now really famously called as neurosphere assays, were developed where you could actually take a stem cell you know, if you take a stem cell, which, as you described, has the potential to proliferate and generate many of its cells, like mm -hmm. uh, of its progeny, um, uh, this potential was captured in a in a dish where you can harvest a stem cell and provide 
certain factors which allow their proliferation. And if these stem cells were present, you would then start getting a cell forming two cells and four cells and eight cells and forming like a sphere or a ball. And by counting how many of these cells, uh, how many spheres you get, you could actually estimate or quantify how many stem cells were present. So this cell culture assay also provided uh, additional evidence or maybe more definitive evidence that there were resident population of stem cells in these adult um, brains. So this was all related to sort of, I would say, technological advancement. But at the same time, really, there was another very interesting line of research which was pursued at the Rockefeller University by uh, Professor Fernando Nottebaum. Uh, he was very famous for studying avian uh, song biology and mm -hmm. how um, in the in the songbirds, the zebra finches, um, during the mating season where they produce song, he noticed that certain brain regions actually expand. And he then showed that that was because there was additional neurogenesis or birth of new neurons happening during this learning period of the song. So this provided an, another angle that not only in rodents, but in other species as well, this process is happening. And I think finally in 1990s, there were then several labs working quite intensely uh, on understanding that if this process is indeed happening in the adult brain, is it some way regulated? You know, is it just happen and, and at some basal level or can it can we actually enhance the production of new neurons? Can we increase it? And that's where they found that there were factors that could influence to both increase neurogenesis, but also decrease neurogenesis. So factors like exercise could increase and stress could decrease. So I think these three lines of evidence in a way solidified. Uh, and the position of adult neurogenesis, primarily still though, are coming from laboratory animals. I have a question about technological aspects. You mentioned that it's possible to grow this organoids, so this uh, spheres, uh, mm -hmm. which um, are composed of neuronal cells. But is it possible? In the petri dish to grow a brain, I'm pretty sure that many many people can ask uh, you this question. Oh, sure. and I think this is this is actually where I think uh, neuroscience in, in the current century is going. I wouldn't say it's possible to grow the entire brain, but I think I'm sure some of you may have heard about something called mini brains. So I think there are technologies where. Um, these cells during from the embryonic brain, like when the developing brain can be seeded and they form these organoids. Um, and these organoids actually start self-assembling and they, they can actually look like a little mini brain. They are not fully mature or adult brain, but they have certainly um, interesting characteristics which resemble um, early development. And, and that uh, technology has actually been quite useful for understanding some of the disease progression, especially if they are genetic linkage to those disease progression with respect to neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, mm -hmm. and also have become a very valuable platform to screen drug candidates. Yes, to minimize the experiments with animals, yes, and to test it on organoids. Uh, Danish, I have a question specifically about your career. Uh, what did motivate you to go into this field? Yes, I think that's been a very interesting journey for me. Um, so my background, so I, I would say a bit about where I come from. So I actually come from India. So I was born and brought up in India, in Mumbai, or as previously known as Bombay. Uh, that's where I did my schooling. Um, I did my bachelor's of science, which uh, with majoring in life sciences and biochemistry, and then did master's in zoology. And that's where I got really interested in the, uh, the developmental biology as a, as, a, as a subject. I was really fascinated 
to learn about really how a single egg and sperm months they fuse how that carries the genetic information to develop the entire organism you know how different parts are specified body plan is laid what makes the head versus what makes the you know the, the trunk yeah, and the tail exactly. yeah so that's where i got really interested in developmental biology and i joined a phd program um at the tata institute of fundamental research uh, which is uh, one of the premier research institutes in india and i joined the lab uh, which was looking at the development olfact of the olfactory system of the the system in the brain which allows us to smell you know it is very uh, important for asian very, uh, yes yeah. so in this lab interestingly i actually worked uh, i used the model organism fruit fly uh, in other words they called drosophila melanogaster mm -hmm. to study how from their larval to pupil transition and from pupil to when they become adult how that olfactory uh, neurons from the antenna how they connect and wire up in the brain you know and how that whole what we kn now known as the odotopic map gets laid so i was looking at the cellular mechanism mean, means which are the different cell types involved with this and what are the molecular me mechanism in terms of which are the different genes involved in laying down this plan and this was my five years of uh, phd where we made really interesting discoveries in um understanding the mechanisms of how this olfactory lobe and how how the olfactory system develops and that uh, really led me to the interesting question from the perspective of that i have studied the mechanisms of neurodevelopment but i wanted to understand the mechanisms of neuroplasticity that once this development plan is completed what are the different elements that can influence um you know the already uh connected and wired up yes what makes already connected and wired up brain yeah and that's where i was uh, um read about this whole process of neurogenesis and i think it intrigued me because i was also not aware and i thought for many years that you know adult born in adult brain you cannot have any new neurons and i was surprised to read a number of papers uh, that showed that in fact this is not true and in, you can actually generate new neurons um and that really got me into the field because i felt like this is really a form of cellular plasticity so as to say it's and i feel it one of the extreme form of plasticity where you have to make space and accommodate new cells into a circuit mm -hmm. which is already formed and to think that this could be beneficial for the brain uh was a very uh captivating concept for me and then i decided that i really want to understand how this process is regulated and more importantly how this process can contribute to our cognition and mood regulation is it possible to define brain regions where neurogenesis is most active and not so active i mean in the adult brain sure sure so yeah we know now that it's not like all the brain regions actually cannot support the birth of new neurons okay and what has been very well established um is that the region which i referred earlier the hippocampus which is in in the temporal lobe that is one of the major regions which actually support this process of generating new neurons uh and this has been shown across different animals and even in humans there is evidence supporting that the other major region that has been shown where neurogenesis uh, does occur is uh it's along the ventricle lining so it's a region called the subventricular zone and in rodents at least there are stem cells which are lining that's um are along the subventricular zone which can then divide and differentiate into neurons and this is a very interesting region because these neurons don't stay there but in fact migrate into the olfactory bulb oh, so I this region, yeah so this is yeah, like a before 
uh, station of um, it is absolutely uh, yeah so there is a depot of where the generation happens but then these neurons have to migrate um along what is known as the rostral migratory stream to enter into the olfactory bulb and once they are in the olfactory bulb number of studies have shown that they can contribute to olfactory learning olfactory discrimination between different smells so they do play a very interesting role in uh, supporting some of the basic functions of the olfactory lobe so these are the two major regions which have been shown uh, to be active with respect to neurogenesis but in addition to that um, there are some other regions which have also gained uh, some attention over the years one of them is amygdala the center for you know fear learning and memory control yeah. yes. and emotional learning also yeah and emotional fear and learning and in fact we were one of the first to show quite definitively that in the uh, rodent amygdala um, there are resident population of stem cells which can generate um, new neurons um, and we could show using modern neuroscience tools that these neurons were active so they could actually fire um action potential their their um basic function of the neuron so all, so amygdala is one of the other regions but the the level of neurogenesis or the number of neurons produced there are relatively much smaller than what's been produced in the hippocampus or in the subventricular zone and there have been some reports that even in the hypothalamus the the center which is involved with uh, feeding uh, hunger uh, aggression type of behavior mm -hmm. hormonal regulation also yes and hormone so even they um, support to a certain extent a level of neurogenesis so hypothalamic neurogenesis has also been uh, shown so i think i would say these are the major areas there there were earlier reports of neurogenesis in the cortex you know one of mm -hmm. our major brain regions but those um, have been quite heavily contested and perhaps it happens only in the disease conditions a lot more than in the basal conditions in the normal healthy situation can we say since new, this uh, newly generated neurons can migrate to different regions can we say that actually in any brain regions the new neurons can appear um again i think there has been a lot of controversy regarding that because i think there are certain regions where this migration capacity is limited but again upon yeah upon injury what could happen is some of the neurons which are already mature and differentiated can go back in time they can de-differentiate what is known as you know de-differentiation wow. i didn't and know that <laughs> yeah and and that perhaps uh sometimes is mistaken as generation of new neurons but it could be de differentiation of neurons especially in conditions of stroke i would say so i think i i don't think so there is a strong evidence to support that neurons from any region can migrate into any other region like uh, extensive migration i would say yeah mm -hmm. i think it's still a very restricted a very restricted migration so I have a question about no I have different question. Let's <laughs> forget it. Just forget it. Um I read that uh, actually the average number of uh, neurons in the brain is almost same during your adult uh, life span. And uh, does it mean that if we have the active neurogeneration we also have the active neuronal death yes and no um this is a quite complicated um and a complex issue um, which hasn't been i would say fully resolved in in mm -hmm. in the in, in the literature um if you talk about just the newborn neurons i think what has been well established is there are many more that are produced but more than half of them die within of within a very short window in in rodents within first week mm -hmm. so you can you can produce 100 neurons and 50 of them will be already gone within the first week so not everything survives 
okay okay yeah but whether the ones that survive and mature and then integrate into the circuit if they integrate integrate into the circuit does it mean that equivalent numbers of other mature neurons should die or will die and i don't think so there is evidence supporting that so i think the whole question about whether these new neurons actually lead to some sort of a growth over a period of time to the hippocampus there is some evidence supporting that with some quantitative measurements so there is an increase in cell number in the dentate gyrus um, especially in animals but at the same time there is uh, also a complementary or uh, an opposite view that suggests that these neurons new neurons only persist they are like a transient population they persist for a while and then they die off so i think i think all these theories are perhaps true to a certain extent because i think all of this are happening simultaneously that some of them integrate but some of them die so um yeah the the the, the field is still open um to provide definitive evidence in this instance Thank you very much. I have two questions but they are very related to each other. Are the newly generated neurons different from the neurons that were generated in um during embryonic development for example? And uh, how do these new neurons integrate into the existing uh, neuronal circuits? um in the, in the brain we have like a systems of neurons that work to, together to establish some functions it's like a team uh in the work for example and a new a new neuron like a new person that uh needs to integrate into the existing team so absolutely it yeah it's like a little social party going on there where you know there are <laughs> newcomers <laughs> new friends and that they have to integrate into the existing social circle um exactly right so i think to answer the first question with respect to whether you we think that the newly generated neurons in the adult brain are similar to their counterpart that are generated in the embryonic brain i think we have some evidence i think the evidence from the rodent studies so especially from mice and rats suggest that they are highly similar but there could be subtle differences in terms of you know as we know the neurons have what i call like a tree like structure so they have their branches you know the dendrites and the roots which are like the axons connecting to the other cells um so there could be subtle differences in their branching pattern the adult neurons may be slightly different than um the ones that are generated um in in the embryo and but this is all really from the rodent studies i don't think so there has been any systematic study and i imagine that would be extremely challenging uh perhaps to do is to compare in the human within the same individual you know whether they are in yeah whether they are neurons which were born during development um would be um very similar in the adult unless unless there are very clear ways to isolate them or to mark them um so i feel i think what's important here to remember though is in a way adult neurogenesis or generating the new neurons in the adult brain is actually a continuation of a developmental program it's a developmental program that is continuing in the adult brain in certain restricted regions so in a way one can think about this as this is a lifelong developmental process this is this is a very optimistic actually because when i was a pupil at school and you know i had biology too and there still in my time uh in our biology books it was said that uh, your neurodevelopment stops at the age of 24 approximately and then neurons only die and it was yeah. a very pessimistic point of view <laughs> but actually yeah. it's not true and i also yeah. found that neurogenesis um 
declines during aging, but again, mm-hmm. it, in, in the normal b- brain, it doesn't uh, stop immediately. And is it true, Danisha, that um, learning of uh, principal and new things um, can trigger these uh, neurogenesic processes? Oh, yes. I think there have been a number of studies in rodents uh, using especially some sort of a spatial learning paradigm or even olfactory learning um, and that can enhance the production or increase this process of neurogenesis. So that's absolutely true. And that's why, you know, the correlation or the, the, the take home after that uh, for humans is, yeah, make sure that you engage in new learning activities, uh, learn new languages, solve some new puzzles, uh, you know, play games. And all like these musical things. instruments also. Musical yeah. instruments. And all these things actually help and assist our brain to maintain that plasticity process, you know, to to make a uh, brain um, really to enhance its neuroplasticity in in the brain. And that includes the production of uh, sort of new neurons. Just a beauty secret. If you want to stay young, learn new things. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And and, and be in a social circle. I think that is very important. Uh, We sometimes forget that we as humans are social animals. And one of the, one of the uh, factors that affect uh, the ongoing plasticity in the brain and brain health is actually loneliness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Social, social isolation. So I think ever so in this connect, in this modern world where we actually like to, in a way, connect through the social media, I think it's also important to have one-on-one and personal connection uh, with people to to remain active, to share stories um, and laugh. I think for me, I feel laughter is the best medicine that keeps you young. This is absolutely great words. And I wanted to add that it was already proved uh, in patients with uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases that if these patients were exposed to uh, social engagement, communication, uh, listening uh, to music, uh, communication with the children especially. It helped to retard neurogeneration. Neurodegeneration, I'm sorry. (laughs) So this is very important. And uh, it is very important to understand how to help elderly population because if we leave uh, people alone, we almost uh, leave uh, people without this social engagement, which triggers neuronal death. Absolutely. I think, yeah, that is, uh, yeah, it's for the brain health, I feel... There are a number of things that are important. Yes, social engagement is very important. Good nutrition is very important. So in terms of having healthy diet um, and a healthy lifestyle, like with exercise, as I said, exercise is one of the biggest, uh, I would say, regulator, one of the largest regulator of neurogenesis. It's one of the major regulator of neurogenesis. So it really helps to exercise helps to enhance neuronal production and their survival. So exercise is important. Diet is important. Social engagement is important. And so is stress management. I think we are increasingly, we are, li- we are living in a world which has increasing levels of um, Human stress, stress, I would say. Absolutely. Yes. I think the stress that we see in all sorts of forms from financial stress to social stress to even, you know, geopolitical stress that we are all experiencing at the moment uh, with number of conflicts that are happening in the world. And this has a huge impact, huge impact on you know, the development and the maintenance of um, a healthy brain. So I think one has to be mindful in terms of um, having ways to reduce um, and manage that stress level. In fact, stress has been shown to be a a major negative regulator of neurogenesis. Stress can be very different. Uh, Stress can be acute 
So, for example, if you have a cup of coffee and coffee is a biological stressor, you expose your body to a small portion of uh, stress. And uh, as a result of this stress, you have a release of uh, cortisol. This is a stress hormone that helps to activate all your body to cope with a stressor or with a stressful situation. In uh, general, this is actually a good mechanism. And to stop this um, loop, you need again to have some cortisol. But if we have a situation of chronic stress, for example, uh, as you mentioned, uh, long, very tough uh, geopolitical conflicts that uh, affect Mm -hmm. us all, or some social social problems or lack of money or i don't know uh, a shitty boss <laughs> everything can be yes uh, this uh, this leads to chronic release of cortisol it leads to that uh, your body lives in the state of permanent alarm and as a result your body doesn't have enough amount of cortisol to stop this loop and it triggers actually a sequence of very tough events for your health, including um, the decline of uh, neurogenesis. Could you please um, explain how is it possible to manage, if it's possible to manage, and uh, how it is uh, linked with the depression? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think when you think about our stress response and stress circuit in the brain, it's actually a a circuit which is evolutionary conserved over millions of years across different organisms. Okay, and it's a it's a our stress response the the um, the axis which we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis, which regulates our stress. Uh, uh, response and recovery um, is underpinning basically survival of an organism. If this axis is not functioning properly, um, survival of an organism um, is, is 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 put in the put under question mark. You know, so you're right that this axis really mobilizes energy stores and it allows an organism to respond to a threat because in a threatening situation, like whether you come across, you know, a snake or you have to present at a major event. Uh, these are all the st- acute stresses, as you say, uh, that can trigger the release of cortisol. But again, what was a very interesting discovery in 1950s and 60s by another brilliant neuroscientist, Bruce McQueen, was that he found that there are the receptors that bind to the stress hormone in the brain. And the concentration of these receptors is highest. One of the high regions that expresses these receptors is the hippocampus. So hippocampus is actually quite a major region which is involved in regulation of stress response and recovery. And so it is no by no coincidence that you know neurogenesis in a way and stress impacting neurogenesis and that playing a role in the consequence of the behavioral effects of stress um, um, is no coincidence. So excessive stress, as we know, can lead to neuropsychiatric conditions like anxiety, like depression. And I think what the research has shown, especially in the neurogenesis field, is this could happen by multiple different ways. One is where this chronic stress can lead to a reduction in the production of new neurons. Um, Although the mechanism by which this occurs is not entirely clear, but we know and we have some evidence um, and others have published this as well to show that these stem cells actually express these stress hormone receptors. And even the newborn neurons, at certain stages during their development, actually have expression of these uh, stress hormone receptors. So stress hormone can actually directly regulate their process of maturation. And that's what we are finding. So this is a new evidence besides 
um, the evidence which is already existing in the field where they have shown it reduces neurogenesis. What we are finding is what stress does is actually alters the maturation pattern of these newborn neurons. And that actually leads to miswiring of these newborn neurons. And disturbance of neuronal circuits. And that's why that leads to disturbance of neuronal circuits. And in fact, what we have been able to show is if we eliminate these dysfunctional neurons from the circuit in mice using very selective targeted techniques, we can actually um, almost uh, ameliorate the anxiety-related behavior that otherwise is seen in these rodents. Is it possible to apply somehow uh, in humans for, mm -hmm. for anxiety treatment, for example? Yeah, so I think obviously translating these into humans to mm -hmm. um, find um, pharmaceutical ways or other ways, neuromodulation ways to target this process is still, I would say, um, a, a while away. I don't think so. We are there yet. But I would say there are other ways that uh, that we can adopt to reduce stress reduction. And that is, I feel, by engaging in positive and um, sort of um, activities that bring you pleasure, whether that is engaging with music, engaging with friends, reading books, or, you know, even being out in nature. I think nature helps a lot to reduce the the levels of cortisol, the stress hormone in, in the body I'm to regulate sure, that. I'm pretty sure that we became very sensitive to different uh, stressful situations so also because we started to spend more time in, in the city and to spend less yeah. time in the nature. In nature. Mm. So I think the natural environment certainly helps and I think one of the other biggest regulator of our stress response is I think our breathing itself. I think breathing is one of the modalities which allows our connection of external world to the internal world. And I think paying attention to breath work, you know, and that's why they suggest that when you are stressed, take some long deep breaths, you know. Yes, exactly. there is a reason. Yeah, there is a reason. And this is why pranayama helps. Yeah, and it helps, you know. <laughs> yeah. Take a deep breath and it helps. So the question is whether one can actually do this in a systematic fashion in an everyday life such that we can actually increase our resilience to stress. So rather than just managing stress, we become more resilient to stress. And I think, um, I think the future research should really focus on understanding the neurobiological mechanisms of resilience, not just recovery from stress. And not just avoiding. Because and not just avoiding. Some Absolutely. concerns about some modern methods of uh, um, educating mm -hmm. children, for example. Um, sometimes I think it is, it is, it, it's, it can be very dangerous when you try to make absolutely ideal stress-free uh, environment for children because we are made biologically in a way to cope with stress. We yes. have actually resources and we, it is an essential to learn children how to cope, how to understand that you have resources to deal yes. with some uh, situations or problems in your life. Absolutely, a bang on target. And I completely believe in this, that, you know, we shouldn't be putting our kids into cotton wool and protecting them all the time. I think they have to experience stress because I think you, they have to get a sense, as you say, that you are equipped to deal with all the challenges. I think the modern way sometimes I feel is um, forgets that we can help ourselves. I think Sometimes we feel the way the society works. I feel we are always trained to ask for help. And we forget that we can actually help ourselves. We don't have to ask for help all the time. Yes, you ask for help when it mm -hmm. is, you know, absolutely required. But When you understand that you don't have enough resources to cope with a problem. Yes, that's it. 
but if you are equipped with that to to learn um and and uh sort of practice that um uh systematically in your everyday life you are you know with with mindfulness with breathing practices um spending as i said time in nature and 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 challenging yourself with things where you require to think of strategies to cope and not only as an adult but as a child as well so challenging children with um interesting problems where they do feel a bit of stress but then where they can find solution and say that look you know this is stress that i can manage i can cope again with something yes yeah so giving that in in low doses rather than not giving it at all uh would be a good strategy i would like to continue with this uh, topic about education i found that in rodents uh, researchers saw that the animals who were exposed to um physical activity and social engagement uh, as you mentioned um in the when they were pups uh these animals had uh, much more developed hippocampus and then later could perform better so it means that they learned faster uh than animals that uh, didn't have didn't have this training so can we say that if we educate children in a way that we provide them with uh, a lot of different activities and things to learn it makes that we create a substantial basement uh, for their success in the future i think there's no doubt and there's mm-hmm. enough research supporting that enriched environment is one of the um major factors regulating the brain plasticity including neurogenesis so if you are put in an enriched environment and that may include new learnings or new toys or um new social interaction all these things are uh, counted as an en- as enriched environment and on the opposite side in fact uh deprivation like uh for example in animals i think they have been um models that they have been uh developed to study stress maternal stress especially so they actually separate the pups from the mother for some time every day just for 2 hours every day and that leads to lifelong um issues in those pups with respect to their emotional well-being uh where with their affective behavior with respect to anxiety and depression so i think enriched environment um new languages um are absolutely very good for growing children and perhaps uh, throughout life yes exactly it means that even um uh, even this i cannot say short term experience but still this experience leads to a long term um development in in in, uh, in the brain and i think this is absolutely fascinating i think i look at brain as one of the hardware that is supporting a lot of the software mm-hmm. right so i think and i think the more malleable you keep this hardware it can support more functions we mentioned uh, cortisol as a hormone that has a strong impact on uh, neurogenesis um but i also found that uh, women um during pregnancy they uh, had the growth of gray matter in the hippocampus and that afterwards uh, the same women were studied and um also they established a higher level of neurons in the hippocampus i cannot remember how it was checked i'm sorry but is it true that uh, the pregnancy itself can be a very good neuroprotective and neurogenic neurogenic event yeah so i think i'm not i'm not sure in terms of any human studies but i do remember a couple of years ago there was a study that was published in science actually uh from a lab of Fiona Deutsch uh, she's quite a well known figure in the field of adult neurogenesis uh, from university of basel where they studied um rodents so again i think mice and showed that um 
during pregnancy, there was a, a stimulation of a very subset, a subset of a population of these neural stem cells um, in the subventricular zone, actually the one that gives neurons, sends neurons through the olfactory bulb. And this process was limited during this pregnancy and um, postpartum period. So it was considered a very transient increase in neurogenesis. So as soon as the pups were weaned, the neurogenesis levels in the mother were back to um, the baseline level. So in fact, the study showed that this production of new neurons during and after pregnancy played a very important role in pup recognition. So maternal and pup recognition behavior, because if they perturbed this process, that behavior was impacted. Of course, so, you have a new creature in your life. You need to have yeah. at least some like new bonding to remember yeah. and to communicate That's with the creature. I know yeah. to bond, to bond with, and especially as you can imagine with rodents. I mean, they they uh, they produce a litter, so there are usually you know multiple yeah. um, okay. multiple babies that are born, and it could be in nature that you know there are multiple mothers who are living in a in a small dwelling. So how do they know that this pup belongs to me and not to the other? Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps this bonding uh, requires, um, and, and that's where neurogenesis certainly plays um, an important role um, in, in this bonding process. Now, whether something similar has been done in, in humans, I'm not 100% um, sure. But yeah, I think, and it was also very interesting to see that only subset of neural stem cells respond. And it's something that we have also proposed a number of years ago in the hippocampus, that not all the neural stem cells in the hippocampus are not all the same. There is a huge heterogeneity uh, and differences. So depending on which part of hippocampus they reside, they can respond to different stimuli. For example, some can respond to antidepressants, whereas some can respond to hormone cortisol. How do antidepressants uh, interact with these uh, progenitor cells? Uh, so this has been a very fascinating area of research, something which is very close uh, to my heart and something that um, we do in our lab as well. Um, and it dates back to some of the pioneering studies that Ron Duman at uh, Yale University he did, I think it was in 2000, he published the first paper showing that the clinical antidepressants, in, uh, antidepressants such as uh, Prozac, fluoxetine, for, example, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. for it, yeah, could enhance um, neurogenesis. And what subsequent studies, including ours, have shown that different classes of antidepressants can act in slightly different fashion but they do influence both the stem cell activity. So they can actually activate stem cells, which are otherwise, you know, uh, lying dormant or quiescent. So they can lead to their activation and these stem cells can then proliferate and generate more cells. Um, it can also influence how these uh, uh, new newborn neurons survive. So it has a positive influence overall in the process of uh, neurogenesis. And some of our work has shown that depending on which class of antidepressant, some classes have a direct effect on stem cells, whereas the other classes act via mechanisms which are yet to be well um, uh, understood. Is it possible that uh, antidepressants uh, uh, also leads to the decline in the level of cortisol? And now, like this high, this this cortisol actually uh, doesn't intervene into natural uh, neurogenetic events, and we have recovery of the absolutely, patient. absolutely. In fact, almost all antidepressants have been shown to impact the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the the main axis regulating the levels of cortisol. And yes, you're right that it actually does regulate that. So as I said, there are multiple mechanisms by which these antidepressants act in the brain, some of them more direct and some of them via indirect mechanisms. Uh, you told that uh, new neurons can replace the injured neurons, but uh, is it known uh, which uh, neurons, neuronal types 
are more susceptible to injuries uh, and more susceptible to the death, for example, induced by, by the stress. Okay, I think I, yeah, I'm not too sure whether there are certain population of neurons which are more vulnerable, but certainly the excitatory neurons are certainly being shown to be affected. I don't know whether the inhibitory neurons which are there in the brain are also affected by stress to the same extent. They are certainly affected, but then <laughs> whether there is a differential response in terms of um, um them call the stress causing death. And I don't think so stress really causes death. I think what it does is is changes the uh, the structural maturity, the structure of the neurons. So sometimes mm -hmm. these neurons what uh, uh, undergo something what we call atrophy. So their dendrites shrink. So you mm -hmm. know the branching shrinks. Well, the branches now. Yeah. Yeah, they they shrink. Um and that leads to the changes in their physiology in terms of how these neurons would respond. So because in the end, each neuron is um, having some sort of an electrical activity, right? So their, their yes. function is defined by their electrical activity. And if you um, have the shorter branches, it means that you will have a, uh, less uh, contact. They will have other contact with, absolutely, less contact with other neurons. And also the timing of their activity will be disturb because in the brain it's all about the timing as well timing plays a very important role in terms of when the signal arrives when the neurons fire and if they don't fire in certain pattern that can be problematic as well thank you very much danisha so we need to conclude our i think wonderful episode <laughs> um could you please name three things that help you to to develop in science and to and that help you just in your life three things three things wow this is they can be long ah for me i think science is all about having patience and perseverance it's a slow process. Discovery process is a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think if one wants to make real contributions in scientific field, one has to be patient, but one has to persevere. I think the second thing which has helped me a lot is you just have to work hard. I don't think so there is any <laughs> easy way out in science. <laughs> but I think the most important thing for me is having that determination, having that vision, you know, vision to be one of the best, vision to make, uh, contribute something new to the field and have that taste for original con contribution is something that, you know, I have aspired and I have strived um, for. So I would say, yeah, patience and perseverance, hard work and determination are the elements that I feel really help um, the making of a scientist and the scientific career. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I, and we started our episode uh, with um, t talking about people who had to go against dogma. And yes. Science always means to be uh, to be a very strong person. Yes. Yeah, be strong Working person. And, and, yeah, and at, at the same time, be ready to accept that you could be wrong. I think that is also very important. That's this is true. a very important uh, form of strength. Yes, yes, it is. To say there you propose a hypothesis and if you disprove it, or you 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 study and you have some evidence, but later on you basically say that I, this was probably not true because now we have further evidence to suggest that this is the way. I think to be open about the fact that you could be wrong, I think is another great characteristic of being a scientist. Thank you very much, Denisha. <laughs>